Thank you for joining the public information meeting for the Drift Road Culvert Replacement Project. My name is Brian Mahoney. I'm a senior project engineer at PAR Corporation, MassDOT's design consultant for this project. There are a few things I need to review prior to getting started. This meeting is being recorded and all parts of the meeting will be considered public record. You are consenting to participate in a recorded event by attending this meeting. Your microphone and camera have been automatically disabled upon joining the meeting. At the end of the presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. And please refrain from raising your hand or entering questions into the chat until the presentation is complete. During this presentation, I will be providing a brief overview of MassDOT's Municipal Small Bridge Program, discussing the project background, scope of work, and construction approach reviewing the anticipated traffic and environmental impacts and impacts to abutting property owners, and briefly reviewing the project timeline from now to the anticipated start of construction. Questions and answers will be at the end of the presentation. MassDOT and their design consultant, Power Corporation, are working closely with the town of Westport on this project. As I mentioned, my name is Brian Mahoney. Also in attendance are Dave Elwell and Greg Berube from PAR, Kathy Doherty from MassDOT, and Westport's town administrator, Jim Hartnett. We will be available to answer questions at the end of the presentation. The Municipal Small Bridge Program, which is administered by MassDOT and 100% state funded, provides financial support to cities and towns for small bridge replacement, preservation, and rehabilitation projects. Projects from each application round are selected for funding based on both need and merit. To be considered for funding, the bridge must be located on a local public way and on the state bridge inventory with a span length between 10 and 20 feet. These small bridges are not eligible for federal aid under existing bridge programs. Starting in 2022, the small bridge program utilizes phased grants to fund the design and construction of bridge projects separately. Phase one grants are for costs associated with the bridge design and permitting. Phase two grants provide funding for construction. When a municipality is selected for a phase one grant, the bridge design is completed by MassDOT and their design consultant. Small bridge replacement projects must satisfy the requirements of chapter 85, section 35 of the Massachusetts general laws, uh, which include design criteria based on the span length and functional class of the roadway and MassDOT review for structural adequacy. The project is located at the Drift Road crossing of Kirby Brook, about two tenths of a mile north of Charlotte White Road extension. Drift Road is a local two lane roadway with one lane each northbound and southbound. Kirby Brook flows from west to east into the east branch of the Westport River. The existing culvert structure, bridge W3021, consists of three 48 inch diameter corrugated metal pipes, approximately 33 and a half feet long. Per MassDOT's bridge inventory information, the existing structure was constructed in 1950. The work limits for this project include approximately 500 feet of drift road from about 220 feet south of the bridge to about 280 feet north of the bridge. Uh, Kirby Bridge, a two-span stone bridge, is located immediately downstream of the current drift road crossing. Kirby Bridge was reportedly constructed in the 1830s or 1840s and is located on a former alignment of drift road. How did we get here? In the spring of 2021, the town of Westport retained the services of PAR Corporation for an inspection of the drift road bridge structure. The following spring, MassDOT added the structure to the state bridge inventory and conducted their own inspection. In June of 2022, the town applied for a municipal small bridge program grant for bridge design and permitting. The following month, uh, MassDOT selected the project for a phase one grant. And in February of last year, MassDOT issued the design contract notice to proceed to PAR Corporation. Why was this project initiated? The existing bridge is generally in poor condition and is considered structurally deficient. All three pipes are severely corroded with many areas of 100% section loss. 
At the upstream side of the structure, shown in the photo here, there is significant channel scour and deterioration of some structural components due to scour. The existing crossing is significantly undersized, restricting natural stream flow, uh, particularly during high flows. The inadequate hydraulic capacity has caused or exacerbated many of the existing deficiencies. Additionally, the crossing in its current configuration does not provide suitable stream continuity or connectivity. The photo on the left shows typical conditions at the upstream side of the structure, looking down the middle pipe. You can see the erosion of the stream bed material, some debris buildup, and deterioration of the pipe and concrete headwall. Uh, the photo on the right shows a typical area of severe pipe corrosion with 100% section loss, exposing the fill material behind the pipe. What do we want to accomplish with this project? The primary goal of this project is to replace the structurally deficient structure with a new bridge designed and constructed in accordance with current state and federal requirements. Another project goal is to reduce the scour potential of the structure and improve stream continuity and connectivity by increasing the hydraulic capacity of the crossing. Additional objectives of this project include limiting impacts to Kirby Bridge and the surrounding area, both during construction and after the project is complete, and minimizing disruption to roadway users during construction. In this graphic, the proposed layout is overlaid on an aerial image of the project area. No significant changes to the existing horizontal or vertical geometry of the roadway are proposed. The work limits for this project include about 500 feet of drift road in the vicinity of the Kirby Brook crossing. As I mentioned before, Kirby Bridge, uh, located just downstream of the drift road crossing, uh, that structure will remain in place. In general, the proposed project includes demolition of the existing culvert structure and guardrails, uh, construction of precast concrete rigid frame with metal bridge rails, installation of natural stream bed material beneath the bridge, guardrail installation at the bridge approaches and full depth pavement reconstruction. The proposed roadway is super elevated with a 2% cross slope to direct surface runoff west towards the inside of the curve of the roadway. Although no significant changes to the existing horizontal or vertical geometry of the roadway are proposed, the drainage patterns will be improved. This graphic shows the typical roadway section at the bridge approaches where full depth pavement is, full depth pavement re reconstruction is proposed. Um, two travel lanes will be maintained and the proposed roadway width varies from about 22 feet near the bridge uh, near the project limits, excuse me, to the to about 28 feet near the bridge. Um, crash tested guardrails are required at the bridge approaches. The proposed replacement bridge is 32 feet wide with a span length of 32 feet six inches. The bridge is skewed to improve the alignment of Kirby Brook at the crossing. Precast concrete wing walls and guardrail transitions are proposed at each corner of the bridge as well as precast concrete approach slabs beneath the pavement at each side of the bridge. Concrete form liners can be specified to provide a textured finish of the exposed faces of the wing walls. This is the transverse section of the proposed bridge perpendicular to the roadway. At the new bridge, two 11-foot travel lanes with variable width shoulders are proposed for a total roadway width of 28 feet, 9 inches. The width of the shoulders will vary due to the layout of the bridge relative to the horizontal curvature of the roadway. S3 TL4 metal bridge rails are proposed. Crash tested bridge rails are required. The bridge rails can be galvanized and painted or color galvanized with a color agreed upon by MassDOT and the town. And it is important to note that railings that have not been crash tested have not received approval from the Federal Highway Administration for use on the national highway system, or have not undergone a crash test simulation, cannot be used on any MassDOT bridge project, including municipal small bridge program projects, such as this one. This is the longitudinal section of the proposed bridge, parallel to the roadway and perpendicular to the waterway. 
The precast concrete rigid frame will be supported on precast footings. At each side of the structure, cast in place concrete will be utilized uh, for a footing base between the top of bedrock and bottom of footing. As I mentioned before, natural stream bed material beneath the bridge is proposed. A precast concrete rigid frame is most appropriate to this site based on constructability, costs, environmental impacts, future maintenance considerations, and design, design parameters, um, such as the required hydraulic opening and the roadway profile and alignment. The existing guardrails at the site were installed by the town about four years ago. About uh, 200 linear feet were installed along the west side of the roadway and about 160 feet along the east side. These guardrails are typical W-beam steel guardrails, and it should be noted that the existing guardrail configuration does not meet current design standards. The proposed guardrails must conform to the requirements contained in the Manual for Assessing Safety Hardware, also referred to as MASH. For this project, MASH test level two guardrails are required uh, due to the design speed and existing site constraints, such as the geometry of the existing roadway and the lateral distance to obstructions or slopes along the sides of drift road. The proposed barrier system type, uh, location, and length, as shown on the 25% plans, were determined based on the site conditions and AASHTO road roadside design guide criteria. The proposed barrier system must be MASH compliant. Steel W-beam guardrail meeting the requirements of test level two uh, with appropriate end terminals or end treatments and transitions to bridge rails are proposed. Transitions to bridge rails are required by the design code. This slide shows a comparison between the existing and proposed typical sections at the bridge. Currently, the existing roadway width at the bridge is approximately 22 feet, nine inches, with about 25 feet between guardrails. The roadway width at the, the uh, proposed bridge is 28 feet, nine inches. As I mentioned before, two 11 foot travel lanes will be maintained and the proposed roadway will have a uh, variable width of shoulders at the bridge. The width of the shoulders at the bridge will range from about two and a half feet to four feet. Uh, depending on the location relative to the horizontal curve of the roadway. Currently, there are no existing pedestrian or bicycle accommodations on Drift Road at the bridge site. Accommodations for pedestrian or bicycle facilities are not included with this, with the uh, scope of work for this project. What is the construction approach? Accelerated bridge construction techniques will be utilized for construction. Precast concrete elements, including the rigid frame, the footings, wing walls, end posts, and approach slabs will be used to expedite construction and minimize impacts to the traveling public. Generally speaking, accelerated bridge construction improves site constructability, the total project delivery time, and work zone safety for the traveling public, and reduces traffic impacts on site construction time and uh, potential delays due to weather. The photo on the right, uh, shown here is from a previous PAR project in Goshen. The precast rigid frame shown here has a shorter span length than the proposed drift road bridge, but the structure type and construction methods are, are similar. What are the impacts? It is anticipated that the bridge will be closed to traffic during construction. Traffic will be detoured around the bridge site via Old County Road, Charlotte White Road Extension, and Route 88. The length of the detour is about four and a half miles. And please note that the detour length indicated here is the full loop uh, from one side of the bridge to the other. The added distance for most trips will be less uh, depending on the origin and destination of the trip. It is anticipated that construction will be completed within the town's right of way and permanent impacts to abutting properties are not anticipated. No permanent easements or takings are anticipated for this project. However, temporary easements may be required for construction access at the bridge. Disturbance to wetlands and other environmentally sensitive areas are unavoidable with this project, but will be limited to the extent possible. 
The project will improve stream continuity and connectivity at the drift road crossing. This project is subject to the jurisdiction of the Westport Conservation Commission, Mass DEP, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The appropriate permits and approvals from those agencies will be obtained prior to construction. Two inventory points located within the project area are listed in the Massachusetts Cultural Resource Information System Database, which is maintained by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. Drift Road from the head of Westport to Route 88 and Kirby Bridge, the two-span stone bridge located just downstream of the Drift Road crossing. Although these are historic inventory points, neither Drift Road nor Kirby Bridge has a legal historic designation. It's anticipated that this project will require submission of a project notification form to the Massachusetts Historical Commission, Bureau of Underwater Archaeological Resources, and affected tribes in accordance with Army Corps Section 106 notification requirements. Kirby Bridge, shown in the photo here, will remain in place. Most of this structure is located outside of the town's right of way and construction work associated with the new drift road bridge will be limited to the immediate vicinity of the existing drift road crossing. Impacts to Kirby Bridge and the surrounding area will be limited to the extent possible, both during construction and after the project is complete. Hydraulic conditions at Kirby Bridge are not expected to worsen as a result of the new drift road crossing with the increased hydraulic opening. Here is a look at the anticipated timeline for the project. Following this public information meeting, we will be uh, continuing to advance the project towards the 75% level of design. The 75% submission and MassDOT review and approval process is anticipated during late spring and early summer this year. At that time, we will also be submitting environmental permit applications, including a notice of intent to the Westport Conservation Commission, Chapter 91 waterways license or permit, water quality certification, and an Army Corps uh, pre-construction notification. The PSNA submission is anticipated late summer. And we expect that the project will be ready for advertising and bidding in the fall, pending funding for construction. Since uh, accelerated bridge construction techniques will be utilized for this project, it's expected that the roadway will be reopened within one construction season, uh, depending on the actual start of construction. Questions and answers. So representatives from the project team are, are now available to answer questions. Please use the raise hand feature in Zoom to request to be unmuted and uh, to, to ask questions verbally. Um, or if you called in, you can dial star nine. The raise hand feature can be accessed by using the reactions button in Zoom. And you can also submit questions um, or comments using the Q&A button. Uh, please remember to state your name before your question and share only one question or comment at a time. Uh, we'll be limited to about two minutes per question or comment. If you have a comment or would like to make a statement, um, I ask that you wait until the end uh, after all questions have been answered uh, before requesting to be unmuted. Again, uh, each question or comment will be limited to about two minutes. Thank you. Okay, it doesn't appear that we have any questions. Okay, we have one from uh, one from the town. Okay. It looks like we have a number of people here that would ask questions. Actually, you make statements, so maybe it's after. I don't know. I think they want a question yeah, first. We, yeah. we don't have any. I haven't seen any questions come in. Um, oh, we have one actually. So yeah, we'll we'll um we'll come back to you guys after we have one question that just came in. So we'll um come back to you right after. Okay. 
I think you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> Hi, you've got my name there, Jackie Branco. Um, you indicated that there was this um, project would take one construction season, and I'm wondering what that means in days, roughly, or you know, in time. What what does that mean? Yes, so probably, I mean, it kind of depends on when construction actually starts, but um, I mean, somewhere between six and eight months for substantial completion, I, I would estimate. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, that was... Um... Okay, Jim. We yeah, have one uh... follow-up to Jackie's question, if you want to take that first. Sure. Um, like he said six to eight months. Mm -hmm. Oh, fish Georgia fish. Thomas, 418 D Drift Road. Um, you mentioned that the timing of the construction, six to eight months. During that construction, does that mean the road's going to be closed for that whole time, six to eight months, or just part of that time of construction? Yeah, uh, probably, I mean, the bulk of the work uh, will require the roadway to be closed. Uh, so it, it will be several months with, with the roadway being closed. And we're we're trying to reduce that that time by you know using accelerated bridge construction techniques with all precast elements. Um, in this case, there's really not we don't really have enough um, geometry to try to phase this and you know keep part of the roadway open. Uh, so that's why we you know we're proposing just a full closure to get the bridge reconstructed as, as soon as possible. Before we get into statements, are there any other questions here? Oh, we have one more question. I didn't understand what the visual will be. So from driving on over the bridge, what will the visual be on each side? And will you be able to see the historic bridge through the guardrails? So, um... I mean, the condition, as far as the sight lines, um, I mean, there'll be the guardrails that are there now, um, the proposed guardrails will be fairly similar as far as the height and, and sight lines. Um, we do need to install bridge rails, which are a little bit higher. Um, I, I don't think it'll have a significant impact on being able to see that, that Kirby bridge downstream. Yes, I think, uh, yes, Greg Bruby from Power. I think if I can add to what Brian says, the <clears throat> as you cross the bridge, the bridge rail is a steel. It's a taller railing. It's a steel, but it has pickets, vertical pickets, almost, um, think of it almost like a deck railing. So you can you can see through the, through the bridge, through the bridge rail. It won't be like a, a solid barrier or a visual obstruction. Is that it for questions from this group? Hey, uh, Dante Arena. I have a question. That's this is this is uh, this is sort of new to me, but it appears to me as though this is almost a 200 year old landmark that we're effectively putting up guardrails in front of. I mean, it's it it. it there's no real visual picture. You're saying precast concrete, et cetera, but there's no real visual of what it might look like finished, which I would appreciate it because it's kind of like everything's concrete, steel rails, this height and that. We can't really picture that clearly in this presentation. But even so, I was wondering whether or not there's any latitude with regard to the materials being used. Given the nature of this site, and given the neighborhood, which is extremely rural, and in my opinion, at least, worthy of at least exploring, trying to preserve, 
it's sort of like this presentation doesn't give us a good idea of what we're going to get. Oh, very accurate with regard to detailed with regard to how long, what's going to go into it, but there's no visual. And my concern, my question is, is again, almost a 200-year-old landmark. My wife and I are relatively new to the area. We moved out here. We absolutely adore it. We love it. And it's like, isn't there any sort of recourse or alternative with regard to what can go in place there in front of this kind of landmark? I mean, some of the statements made seem pretty, I don't know, generic and clinical with regard to like, for instance, traffic. I walk my dog three, four times a week out by there. People run, I wave to them from any way and in, in the surrounding area, people walk, run, ride their bikes. This isn't, you know, this is our neighborhood. And like I said, it's, this seems like a very, very sort of clinical, sort of generic solution. No aesthetics, with no appreciation for the aesthetics that you would hope would go into something like this. I know it costs money. I'm not, I don't mean to be naive. But at the same time, you've seen other counties, cities, you know, put up some, some really, really nice, you know, um, guardrails, et cetera, that kind of like blend in nicely. And I was just wondering, I mean, what, would, what would it take to do the same here? Is it just a money issue? And what would it take to cooperate with the engineering firm pair here, is it pair or par and mass thought? I mean, what, what would it take to collaborate in order to come up with a solution that would, maybe we can, you know, come up with a solution that would be pleasing to all. I'm just asking, because I'm all, you know, kind of new to this. So. Great question. Yeah, good. Very good. No, you bring up a, it's a very good question. Um, of course, uh, aesthetics does play a big role in it. Where we are in the process is early on. Um, we're in the preliminary design phase where we determine basically what we need for geometry and the size of the bridge, the span, um, and that, what that has to do with it. Um, where the location is sort of limits itself to the type of bridges is a shorter span. So, um, there's only so much you can do with a, a short bridge the way it is. Uh, we do look into things like features, um, form liners for concrete and stuff to give it a texture and, and a, and a different look, um, things like that. It's, you know, where it sits is you don't see much of the bridge that's underneath you. Um, like I show you, it's much better looking structure than what's there now, um, with that but you know and as far as the the guardrail thing um a lot of that is there's been a big change in the regulations and the code and the design codes in the past less than two years um with an emphasis on roadside safety uh due to a lot of research and a lot of new data that's come in so there has been um they have a lot of data you know, supporting the need for the, for the guardrails in these areas. Um, they're not, we basically, you do minimize them to the amount possible, but we are required to protect them due to certain geometric deficiencies. Um, when you have a curve, when you have a drop-off, when you have certain types of, of features that they, they're required um, by the code. So uh, it's, it's, you know, we play a balancing act. <laughs> Yeah, and just just to add on to what Greg was saying, um, we're we're limited with what we can do. Um, is you know as far as there's there's physical site constraints. Um, you know the structure has to pass a certain amount of flow underneath it. Um, we also have the you know the curvature of the roadway um, in that area, and then also you know we have to design to uh, we have to adhere to state and federal design and and safety requirements as well. I guess I have. Oh, did you? No, no, you go. go. No, I, my question is the same as Mr. Okay. Um, Patrick McBride, uh, 450 Drift Road. Uh, I just want to address the guardrail issue up front because uh, that's really the reason uh, we're here today, tonight. Um, and I appreciate everything that <clears throat> MassDOT does and has done. 
and also everything that the state has done with the small bridge uh, uh, municipal replacement program. I think it's a great program. It's a wonderful thing to have for uh, towns to tap into, uh, like the town of Westport. So clearly we have an opportunity here to do something right, to do the right thing. And as uh, Dante said, and, and other neighbors have always been talking about for the last four years is we as the town of Westport have an opportunity to do the right thing, uh, to be innovative, be creative, work with <clears throat> Mass DOT to come up with a solution that fits this unique, and I, again, I say unique historic treasure. Uh, so uh, the guardrails, the guardrails were inspected by the state two years ago. They were said they were in compliance and there was no need to remove them or extend them. So that's what we were told by the town. That's what we were told by the state of Massachusetts. So what you are claiming that they are out of compliance differs from what we were told by the state of Massachusetts. Okay, that's number one. Number two, um, we talk about tangents. Are these these yellow crash things, the yellow boxes? I'm not an engineer. Are those those yellow boxes that you have to hit and they expand or contract? Oh, you're talking about the deformable blends at the the guardrail. Yeah. Yes, right. those are those usually come. They come different types. Um, they all serve the same function. They're energy absorbing. Um, they use to progressively fail. Sometimes on narrower roads, when they're closer to it, they'll put a chevron reflective chevron, yellow and black sticker on it, so they're a little easier to see. Um, with that, I think to go back to the compliance thing, I didn't. I, I don't believe and if i did i apologize for misleading you i didn't believe i said they were not in compliance i'm just saying that what we need to do needs to remain in compliance as well um which is why you're seeing guardrails in areas where they didn't used to be guardrails so i want to get back to this tangent end mm -hmm. that what i see when i look at that drawing mm -hmm. is a yellow box that contracts Mm -hmm. that, is that what's being proposed here? The we're, we're early in the phase. It will be that type of a of a system. Um, there are several different systems around there. Um, they're generally not. They're no different in size than a normal guardrail tend to be. Everything the energy absorbing system tends to stay inside the the guardrail itself. Okay. Um, I have a photograph of uh, Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, where a bridge was built in 2019 uh, under the Small Bridge Act, uh, which is what, four years ago, three years ago? And there is no tangent end at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that the guardrails in Massachusetts, that new law was updated in 2017. Uh, so uh, this was two years after that. And it's the same situation as our situation on Kirby, Burke, and Drift Road. Same exact situation. Also, the guardrails are not extensive and they have an eight to 15 foot drop off with no guardrail protection there. So again, what you're telling us is not what I'm seeing when I drive around Massachusetts and look at bridges that were completed in the Small Bridge Municipal Replacement Act. So I'm, that's concerning to me. The other concern, bigger picture is, let's not get the cart before the horse. Let's not go designing all this stuff and then come back and listen to what we have to say. Okay, then that's how we got here in the first place. Things were done, and then we were brought in and asked about what do you think about this, what do I think about that. So I think our point is we want to have a say in what get, goes in and how it goes in. We want to be able to explore alternatives and options and not sit here and have 40 minutes of things thrown at us and then have us give us two minutes to respond. I don't think that's fair. Okay. Um, yeah, going back to the, the guardrail thing, um, the newest guardrails, what's called MASH, the Manual for Assessing Safety Hardware, has come out only the new latest guard, uh, guardrail and bridge rail requirements have only come out in the past couple of years. Um, I'm familiar with what you're talking about with the bridges. We have designed ones under the small bridge program that have railings and guardrail systems that are no longer considered uh, adequate. They're considered substandard by the latest um latest regulations uh those regulations tend to change quite frequently now um as we collect more data there's a lot more data concerning the the alarming rays and um vehicles leaving the path of travel um due to several reasons uh, with that 
So that comes with that. And as far as being far along in the process, we're only at the 25% design phase. Um, like I said, we've, we're only at the point now where we, we size up the, we determine the structure based on hydraulics, based on the underlying soil conditions, um, based on the roadway geometry. Um, obviously cost comes into a, a function. Um, even though we do work for mass, we mass, mass dot, we still have a, a fiduciary duty to the town to make sure that we, um, we don't waste your money as well. Um, we are required. Um, our licenses are are tied to that, but we are required to follow all regulations from both state regulations, federal reg regulations, and there are other several ones. Um, those regulations predominantly deal with much like a building code minimum safety standards. So we design to those. Um, so there are certain standards that we mm -hmm. have to adhere to that there really isn't much of a a leeway on um, with that. So that's, you know, what we do, we try to, we always try to minimize the impacts uh, to the surrounding environments with both the, the, the work we do itself, as well as um, any conditions during construction, whatnot. Um, believe me, we, I like to make nice looking structures too. Uh, so it's, uh, we don't, you know, we try to, get you, you know, something that fits in context sensitive within the area. Uh, but we haven't gotten to that phase yet. We want to have the public information meeting to sort of introduce people to the project, discuss what the plan is and what our steps are going to be moving forward as we move into the final design, which will be happening later this year as we go through the rest of this year. Um, 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 I have sort of a sentence, question statement. My name is David LaLima and I live on uh, 418D Drift Road. And I think it's important for this discussion to have some context. And um, because in 2020, um, almost four years ago, approximately four years ago, uh, the town engineer decided to put guardrails up with chapter 90 money. And there was just so we're clear, no zero input from the community. There was no data. There was nothing to support the installation of guardrails, which sent the whole neighborhood into a tizzy. And it's still a very sensitive point. So it's very disconcerting when you come here and you give us a proposal which expands, not minimizes, expands guardrails. We here live in a country environment with a historic country road, stone walls, and you want to put mass turnpike installations into our neighborhood problematic for us and problematic because we were sort of led to believe that there would be some input into this process. We were not led to believe that the input would be at a public hearing after you give us a engineering type um, proposal for what's going on. I mean, the trigger, just so we're clear, just the mention of guardrails is a trigger for this entire neighborhood, a trigger. And you're adding to the trigger, okay? And we had no input, zero, from the time this started four years ago. And when we tried to talk to PAR, to you or someone else, people refused to talk to the neighborhood. Refused. We had no input. So here we are now. Here we are now. And you're presenting this 25% plan with all its details. You're converting this town to a suburb. That's what you're doing. And I, I wonder if the governor and the secretary are aware of this project's implications, it's, it's well important to have culverts repaired. We're not against the culvert repair. We're against or dis dissatisfied with what you're gonna put on top of it and how you're gonna change the entire neighborhood with precast this, precast that, I can't do anything. I have no exceptions. I'm not allowed to do this. What we really want, I think as a result of this meeting was to sit in a room with you with, with the DOT, with PAR, and tell you what we don't like and tell you what we like. And can you accommodate our interests and our concerns? That's all we want. But you've already sort of laid out that, well, it's only 25%, but here are the rules and they're not really negotiable. That's not easy to hear in this discussion. So what we'd like is some kind of acknowledgement or agreement that you will agree to sit with us and talk with us about what we not this this is this is nice 
this this may comply with some kind of requirement that you're supposed to talk to the community, but this is not satisfactory for us in the neighborhood. And this has been going on for four years. And so every time you say the word guardrail, you're just putting a pin into people, you know, pushing them over the edge. That's what's going on here. So I, I, I just, I think you, if you can uh, uh, promise us or agree with us that you will sit with us and talk with us and try to explain to us, and we know there are exceptions to this, we know that. We've read the rules ourselves and there can be accommodations. And we'd like to have you he hear you say that, that we're gonna work with you collaboratively to solve these kinds of problems, not to come in here and change our neighborhood to make it look like the mass turnpike, because that's not what we want. We do not want the mass turnpike. We had no data for accidents, by the way, none, not zero data for the reason for a guardrail in the first place. The speed limit is less than 40 miles an hour on this road. We've never had a history of, a, of an accident. And now you want to come in and make it look like you can drive, you know, a 70, 70 ton truck down the road and because we don't want it to go into the, it, it doesn't make, it's, it's illogical to us. So we, we need you to sit with us and explain to us why you're doing this and you have no choices or you do. That, that's what we're not hearing. Okay, okay David, this is, yeah. this is Kathy. Hi, from... hi, Kathy. I've talked to you before, I know. Yes. Um, first of all, we are not going to, um, I'm sorry that you're upset about this. We are not going to sit with you individually to explain things to you. This meeting, this project information meeting is above and beyond what is in the small municipal bridge program in the first place. So what we need to do is we need to, to understand exactly what your concerns are and take care of them tonight because we're not going to meet again and we're not going to meet with you one-on-one -on -one individually. This is, this is the meeting. This is it. This is what we've been told is the limits of what we are going to provide. So we need to understand exactly what your concerns are. If your concerns are about the length of the guardrail, the, the color of the guardrail, um, I'm not really too sure what project you're referring to, but we can't use timber guardrails anymore. They're not allowed. We can't do that. And so if that's what you're talking about, then we absolutely can't provide that. That's above, uh, I mean, that that's, doesn't comply with the state, state requirements. So we can't do that. Um, if it's something about the precast concrete, um, everybody from PAR indicated that we do have, I mean, we can add textures and we could add colors to the concrete to make it look a little bit more rustic, similar probably to your historic Kirby Bridge. Um, but no, the guardrail is going to be steel. It has to be steel. It can be a color. It doesn't have to be the shiny metallic, uh, you know, armor galvanized that you typically see. I mean, we do have colors, you know, we do have the brown or the, the rust color and the green colors, but no, we are not going to have a separate meeting. First of all, there was no benefit of us coming to you without having an idea of what we could do here. And so if you're asking why we didn't meet with you before, it's because we had to get to the preliminary design where we are right now and no further to figure out what we could do at the place. So we had some answers for you rather than just saying, oh, well, yeah, we might be have a chance to look and listen to that. And so as far as that goes, like I said, my point is, um, I want to tell you, we are not going to sit down with anybody individually. Why? What's to do reason? this because it's the reason, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. The question what is the reason you will not meet with us? We because with this is this is the meeting with you at this time. That's this not enough for us. No visual. So how can we how can we talk about it tonight when we don't even know what it looks like? It's like a so, so Kathy, um, this is Patrick McBride. Uh, so we understand that Mass DOT. Uh, your agency will not meet with us. Um, that's okay. We'll, we want to meet with PAR Engineering. They're the individuals who are designing this bridge and submitting it to you for approval. Is that correct? That's true, but the town would have to pay them. You'd have to pay them yourselves 
to do that. The Mass DOT is paying them now, and we have paid extra for this project information meeting, which typically we don't do with municipal small bridges. And so this we've paid for, and well, this Kathy, is it. Kathy, I, I'm sorry, I take exception to that. Power Engineering's proposal to the state and to the town for $299,000 includes several public meetings, several. Matter of fact, I think it's a total of five meetings that they will hold with city town representatives that we should be a part of. It's in their proposal, so you can go back and look at it. So it's in there, it's, it's included in that proposal. Go back and look at it. Anyway, Greg, could you speak to that? Um, I'd have to go back and look at it. We did- um... I can pull it up for you. You need to, well, we did, we did a proposal to the town. Um, and then when it got part of the municipal small bridge program, we did another proposal to MassDOT. MassDOT has standard operating procedures that prescribe the, the scope of our services. Um, so that is what we are bound by. That's our contract with MassDOT. We don't have a contract with the town. The town would have been a different proposal which would have encompassed a little bit more work because we have been working on the town's behalf in this case here we're working for mass dot the idea behind the, the small bridge program is to get you guys the design and get you a bridge and help you with the cost of the bridge um where otherwise a lot of these towns would not be able to afford this so what is the cost of the preliminary design for this bridge greg I would have to go back and look at that. I don't have that off the top of my head. It's two hundred ninety-nine thousand um, dollars. I don't know which document you're referring to. I'd have to see it honestly to know. Excuse me one second. Um, it's the January nineteenth, twenty twenty-three uh, letter to from you to Miss mm -hmm. Carrie Lavalle, PE, mm -hmm. Deputy Administrator and Chief Engineer, Mass Department of Transportation, 10 Park Plaza, Boston, Mass. Uh, attention, Miss Marie Joyce Rose, PE Director of Project Management, RE Municipal Small Bridge Program, Westport Bridge, number W30021, project number to be determined, contract number 117494, uh, project manager, Miss Kathy Doherty. It is a 26 page proposal. It's the back page is $14,000 for soil testing uh, from Soil X Corp, $50,000 for WSP uh, surveying, and $299,000, $299,600 for your work on the pre preliminary uh, design. Uh, total of uh, Sixteen thousand twenty-one hours. Uh, to date, you've done two hundred eighty-three hours worth of work on the twenty-five percent proposal. That's a lot of money. Tell me about the funding for the uh, small business program. How does that work? Small bridge, small bridge, and small business. I always say small business. How does a small bridge? Is it a hundred thousand dollars for design and five hundred dollars for construction? The way the program runs is it's yes, it's a hundred thousand. If the town elects to pay for their own designers, they mm -hmm. the state provides them with a hundred thousand dollars for design. If the town elects to have Mass Dot um, enter into a contract with the designer, then the the price is based on the price we negotiate with Mass Dot. So that's three hundred thousand dollars. Um, I, like I said, I'd have to look at the proposal. I don't have that in front of me. Okay. And then what's the construction? How much does Mass uh, reimburse for construction costs? Um, it would be $500,000. Okay. So and what's the cost of, of this construction based upon preliminary, the preliminary, based upon what we just heard? Brian, do you have that number yeah. on top? Um, Probably in the, the $2 million range. Okay. So let me just put this on the table now. We're talking $2.3 million. Why are we even talking? $600,000, 
2.3 million. Where's the other, what's that? 1.7 million dollars coming from? Uh, the town would have to secure those funds on their own. We have 1.7 million dollars? No. no. So, so, so there are other funding sources you can get on the transportation improvement plan, the regional planning agency that pays for a lot of like we're doing the roundabout on Route 177, which is a $2 million plus project, which is being paid by the state through the TIP program. So there are other funding sources. We haven't got there yet, and I'm not committing to that because I don't know for sure, but um, it's possible that it could be included in another funding source. Can I ask Kathy this question? Kathy, this is David Lalima. Um, if we didn't take state money, what options would we, if we decided to fix this bridge ourselves? What 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 regulations would be would we be re required to adhere to? You would still have to comply with all the state and federal regulations. You so you uh, so to. I'm clear. Um, you may let me finish, please. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. You may have you ha may have a little bit more leeway um, as far as um, what you wanted to do. You would have to provide the minimum hydraulic opening that we had. Mm -hmm. But if you had unlimited funds, then you could make the bridge as long as you want it. If you had unlimited funds and you could wanted to make it wider and go outside the towns right away and acquire right away, like I said, unlimited funds, you could make it almost as wide as you want to given the constraints of the environmental, environmental, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, environmental constraints. But you would have, I mean, you wouldn't have unlimited things because this for this particular site, there's only so many things that actually fit into this and fit into it well. Of course, you're talking about state funds. And so we are going to be very cautious and we're going to use our funds to as efficiently as we possibly can. Can I just ask you this one philosophical question and I won't ask any more. I think what you're doing is is, is, is bifurcated. You're doing a good job fixing culverts and you're doing a lousy job converting these rural neighborhoods into um, almost um, suburban kind of towns. You're gonna take a very rural, beautiful road and put what, what you've just spent an hour talking about, which is all well, these mandates and requirements and regulations for traffic that does not exist on this road. It's, it's ethereal, it's not real, okay? but you have to do it, I get it. And so the question is, the more culverts that go on in this re culvert repair, small bridge repair, the more you're gonna transform this, this rural area into something that, that it will never be the same ever again. And I think it's shameful that that's what, we're, that's what we're talking about. That's the bottom line here. What you want to do, whether we agree to do it or not, what you wanna do is change the character of drift road. That's what you're doing. It already happened with the guardrails, it already happened and you're gonna magnify it exponentially. So I know it's just an opinion, it's what you're doing. I understand, I appreciate your job, but you're changing the character of the rural areas. Yep, and I appreciate your thought there, but there is nothing prohibiting the, the traffic on that road that it's being designed for. What do you mean? I don't get. I don't um, there's know. nothing prohibiting uh, trucks from going on that road. There's nothing prohibiting um, anybody, you know, because you have wide enough lanes there, or we're going to be providing wide enough lanes for all types of traffic, um, and you have them now. I mean, you have you have a little, you have a, a narrower bridge with no shoulders, and so we're going to be providing you with um, more safer lanes and um, shoulder widths in case there's somebody walking or biking out there, they don't have to jump over the rail to be safe so they don't get hit that, by a vehicle. That, that, but there's nothing precluding any type of vehicles from using that roadway. It's not, it's 40 miles per hour. Um, Excuse me, Kathy, it's 30 miles per hour. Well, okay, the, and, that's and what the post- have a tangent end on highway per mass law you need a 40 mile an hour. So it's not a highway, it's a local rural road. It's 30 miles per hour. So there's no need for a tangent because that's at 40 to 45 miles an hour. That's a state yeah. law. Yeah, like I said, if there's nothing precluding anybody from going, you know, whatever seed, we have to make it safe for every vehicle that goes there. Um, like I said, even though it's rural local road, there's still requirements 
like I said, I believe you said it was a TL2 crash test two for a local, real local. Didn't you, Brian? Yeah, it's TL, yeah, it's yeah. TL2. Okay, so that's what's required for your roadway classification. And so you can't, even if you were to spend all the money yourself, you would still have the same guardrail requirements. They would still, because that's your roadway classification based on, um, I'm, I'm not even really too sure, Greg or Brian, I'm a mm -hmm. bridge engineer, so I don't really mm -hmm. know. Is it based on uh, what rural, rural local is uh, it's, on ADT? It's based on, there's several factors, ADT, um, design speed, prevailing speed, the <laughs> roadway geometry, both vertical and horizontal, as well as the features on the side. There's a, there's a several, the number of trucks that use the road, there's several, it's not just one set parameter. There's a series of different things that need to be checked um, that determine the, the, what they call now a test level. Um, so this test level of protection that's required for the traffic. So there's not any one number that's used anymore. And on the mass general laws, probably from a while back, these changes have changed recently um, in that. And that's those are those are requirements that come down from the federal government. Hey, Kathy, and there's someone waiting with a question. Maybe we can go to the question and then come back to okay, us. Okay, just one second. We're whipping around a lot of acronyms here. ADT is annual daily, daily yes. traffic. And he's talking about percent trucks. And so when the traffic was, when the traffic count was done, that was determined. And so, like I said, the guardrail is based on, just to wrap up, the guardrail is based on that information that does have numbers behind us. So let's go to the question and then we'll come back to the, um, to everyone else. Hi, so good evening, everyone. Um... My name is Jeff Borges. I'm here with Irene Aruda, owner of 418 Adrift Road. Uh, we are completely aligned with the questions and the concerns that are in the room. Again, completely aligned. In respects to the project, uh, with 418A under APR, we're, we would like to understand if, if, you know, I'm hearing MDOT and excuse, you know, MassDOT, excuse me, and excuse our ignorance here, but has APR, has MDAR been involved in this project? Uh, are there any impact, are there any concerns, as my grandmother here, Irene, landowner, that we need to ensure that there's no concerns or implications due to the construction of this project? And we wanna make sure that this is you know, completely aligned with that program. Um, you said MDAR? APR, A APR. Yes, so this is Farmland mm -hmm. 418A, Drift Road, yep. Farmland okay. for many years. Mm -hmm. and you know, we are responsible to to oblige by those rules. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is a concern that we have um, mm -hmm. when it comes to the overall construction of whatever this this becomes. You know. <clears throat> right. The the bridge itself lies within the, the state right away. Mm -hmm. I mean, not the state right away. I'm sorry, the town right away. So in that sense, it the roadway itself falls under town requirements, the bridge itself because of the length of the bridge under Mass General Law Chapter 85, Section 35, there are um, requirements that all bridges, once they get over 20 feet, fall under the purview of the Mass DOT and need to be designed to the Mass DOT requirements, which are essentially the Federal Highway, um, Federal Highway Association's design requirements as well. Massachusetts adds additional requirements on top of that that are unique to the, the state. So we fall under that requirement and that supersedes some of the other things. Now, where you have other zoning requirements and things like that, those pertain to the properties outside of that right of way for the roadway. Okay, so then if understanding that answer, then, then mm -hmm. you know, any, anything, and this is really more on the westbound side of, of Drift Road, right, running towards the east branch of the Westport River, is that property that we're speaking on behalf. This, mm -hmm. this has been, you know, there is no, there will be no repercussions to any constructional, you know, damage to the environment in respect to the the brook, 
uh, and any of the ecosystem that involves? No, everything we do, uh, actually, we are acquired under the Mass uh, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, um, as well as the Army Corps of Engineers. There are certain requirements that we have to adhere to to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, we minimize as much as possible for any excavation that's needed for the the bridge. We will divert the, the stream so the stream keeps flowing and everything they do occurs behind Basically, as they call it, in the dry, so that way we're not causing a problem with water quality, everything else. Um, so all of that stays. And what we've done here is to keep the bridge as close to the existing limits that are there now as possible, because we want to try and minimize the amount of, of disturbance. Yeah, that, that, I guess that part is just a little bit concerning to us is, you know, you know, we can't, you know, we have to be mindful of clearing land or, or, you know, agriculture or whatever in, in these particular zones. And so I picture vehicles traveling over, you know, destroying that area, right. As, as construction is. And so I just really, we want to make sure that, that all parties are fully aligned with this project and that there's no repercussions on the landowner from my grandmother here in respect to the construction, mm -hmm. right. That that's, that's a concerning part for us. Is like, they, you know, they come back after the project is done, land has been changed, right? In particular to close to the waterways. And, and then there's repercussions that we now are, are obligated to be responsible for that we had nothing to do with, right? This is, we, we don't support it clearly, you know, respect to protecting the bridge, whatever, making sure. But aside from that, we wanna make sure that there's nothing falling back on the landowner um, in regards to this construction project. Yeah, no, no. Everything we do is to to all but, you know, eliminate that chance with that. I say we stay we stay as close as we can to the bridge because we try and limit disturbance. We don't, you know, where we will we set a work area that the contractor is allowed to work in. He's not allowed to go outside of it. That is sort of set when we we set that that limit of disturbance when we go um, and file a notice of intent with the conservation commission. Um, and then at that point, they, they are, the contractor is more or less confined with that, within that area. Um, generally speaking, they like to stay up on the roadway area anyway, because it's easier to work because it's a flat surface. It's got decent uh, footing on it. So when they drive over, it doesn't, they don't have to worry about things. So most of the work that gets done, say outside a roadway will be essentially remove the old culvert and put the walls in for the new one um, and put the new bridge in. Okay. Well, no, thank you. Thank you, Greg. I just, you know, Patrick mm -hmm. question there and maybe can add more, more colors. As a result of the construction, the water flow, uh, movement of rocks and I will, will change the nature and the parameters of the stream naturally. Yes, you might not do anything, but naturally when we get the rains that we get right now, that brook is flowing and it has changed today from where it was yesterday. And that directly impacts the Aruda farm and my property based upon the flow through one, one waterway versus three waterways right now. Mm. Uh, the yes, I, I realize that um, the, the the stream bread will always mm. change. I mean, that's nothing we can't stop. That um, that happens everywhere. Um, the condition we're putting in is actually better than what there is now. The problem mm. um, right now is that while we will be opening the waterway up, we're actually going to be flo slowing down that water that goes through there now. What happens now is it gets constricted at those three barrels. Mm. So you can think of it almost as putting your thumb on the garden hose. Um, and so the water goes through there and it accelerates. So when we put this new one in, first of all, we rebuild, we rebuild the stream bed itself to match what's indicative of the stream bed, say upstream. Um, so that way we make sure that the, the stones and everything else are about the same size because we need to worry about marine life as well. Um, but also we want to make sure that they don't get transported that easily. Um, storms, it's a reality that the storms today are much 
more intense and much more frequent than they used to be. Um, the 10 year frequency storm happens about every year and a half to two years. Now we'll all see hundred year storms several times in our lifetime. That's the reality of things. And that's, what's prompted a lot of these culvert replacements because what was put in 50, 60 years ago was okay is no longer okay. And, um, this year, especially, there's been a significant amount of damage in other parts of the state due to due to undersized culverts. Mm-hmm. Um, so this this will at least minimize that amount. Um, you know, we we anticipate storms to be more intense and more frequent in the future. So we have a question from uh, Mr. Brewer, select board member. Yes, uh, my name is Richard Brewer. I'm a resident of Westport at 1971 Main Road. I'm also the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, and I represent them here tonight, uh, among other things. I'd be here anyway, particularly the Board of Selectmen. I'm interested in the earlier comments regarding continuing a discussion with PAR uh, that the Department of Transportation would not be involved in, and also points out to us uh, that it, it would be a, that co- there'd be a cost for doing this. But I'm really interested in uh, two things. One question here addressed to PAR, would PAR be willing to do that? And it could be several meetings. And if there is agreement, let's say the uh, residents uh, have an idea, about an aesthetics idea that, that meets PAR's uh, approval or understanding and they're, they're fine with it. Would PAR have the freedom to go ahead and implement that as part of the plan or does it need to go back to the uh, DOT for further review? Do you want to answer that, Kathy? Or do you want yeah. me to answer that? Yep. Okay. I'm I'm on it. Um, yeah. Um, and Jim has graciously um donated or allowed you to um to use his email address or use him for any ideas that you may have. Um, even if someone who is on who is afraid that because we're recorded. Um, and they don't want to show their face or they don't want to have their voice heard, um, by all means, if you talk to Jim or send it to his email, um, we will absolutely listen to all of your um, your um, suggestions. And um, I don't know if it was Dante, were you the one that was telling us that you had of the bridge or was that there was a bridge that was done in 2017. If you just want to give that information to Jim and so we can get get it to pair, I mean, to Mm -hmm. par so that we can consider, oh yeah, if you have something that, well, something that's not prohibitively expensive, as long as it works and it's, you know, within the limits of um, the municipal bridge project, then yeah, we are going to listen to everything, everything that you say tonight. And um, anything that the town might decide that they want to um, to do as far as the color or of the concrete or the texture or that kind of stuff, any of that kind of stuff. Yes, you can, like I said, Jim has grac- graciously volunteered his, um, his email address for after this meeting. If there's something that, you know, that you didn't quite think of that you wanted us to take care of, yes. And Par will definitely answer those questions and um, similar to what we're doing tonight. This is not, you know, when I said this is the last meeting, it is the last time that we are going to get together in a group and have everybody available, but you can submit questions and comments at any time. Now is the perfect time to do it because we're just in the very beginning of the design. We just finally got a grip on all of the requirements, the hydraulic, which is the stream flow, um, the structural requirements, what type of vehicles, um, the extent of the guardrail that's required based on the daily traffic and the percent truck traffic. And so we just barely have a grip on that. And this was the option, the best option that um, PAR thought would take care of all of the requirements. Now, if there's something else that you would like us to look at or consider, like I said, particularly the um, project that was done in, under the Municipal Small Bridge in 2017, although that's pretty long ago, so I don't know that. Yes, get us that information and um, PAR will definitely respond to that. Um, I would like to 
if I could just, uh, Dick, you had another um, question. No, that, no that, I mean, that is, you had another question. Yeah, really answer, I'm satisfied for the time. Mm -hmm. Done? Yeah. yeah. Um, I just just a second. Does Susan, do you have a question? I'm assuming I'm talking to the group that the, the board of the selectmen that Richard, I'm assuming that you're in the group, but there's a separate person, Susan, right. who has her hand up. Right. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, I, I really, and I haven't really been paying close attention to this. My name is Susan Fedors and I'm at 463 Drift Road. I've been here for 30 plus years. Um, my question has to do with really what precipitated this. Um, is, is this something that the state is doing for all historic um, communities? Yeah, I, I'm, I haven't seen this on a lot of other bridges. I'm just curious as to what was the reason that that we're doing what we're doing why did all of a sudden one day i know i noticed that the state that the town had put up the guardrails i'm just curious what started this and why this bridge to that uh, um kathy i could answer that if you want but you're free to answer it up oh, you're muted kathy there i am <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, the reason that um, this was done is um, because par if you um, if we go back and if you can get back to that screen, Brian, as far as how we got here, um, par originally inspected the bridge because the bridge does belong to you to the town of Westport. Um, and so and it will continue to it will continue to remain your property even after it's replaced using state dollars. And so, um, like Brian said, that's when Park Corporation conducted a bridge inspection um, at the town's request in 2021. Um, the structural deficiencies is what is okay. what's causing okay. it. There's hydraulic and that kind of stuff, um, but hydraulic deficiencies sometimes we can kind of compensate for, but structural deficiencies is what's really driving that we replace this. We do not want to close this bridge. We don't want to close any bridge. Um, and so, yes, it's the structural deficiencies. It's also the hydraulic deficiencies, the three pipes instead of the two big open culverts that used to take care of this stream. Does that answer your question, Susan? Uh, it, well, it doesn't in terms of the historic, other historic communities. So if you have a bridge in Essex or you have a bridge and I'm just not seeing, you know, guardrails, crash rails at all, all these bridges. Is that what the intention is? When, when you find these kinds of deficiencies, that's what you're going to be doing at mm. all of these? Or is no. this- I'm is sorry, that, go ahead. Is that the go forward for all bridges in Mass, all historic bridges in Massachusetts? Is that what's going to be happening? Uh, well, first of all, this isn't, even though it's historic to you and it has been around for a while, um, it is not considered historic as far as from the state. No, we are absolutely not plowing down all the old and putting up new shiny, you know, new shiny stuff. We can't afford to do it and we have no desire to do it. I mean, this is one of the oldest, oldest part of the country that there is, is Massachusetts. Um, and so, no, it is not a mindset to go through and destroy all of the historic, you know, that kind of stuff. We try to to keep in mind the area that we're in, but we do have to keep you guys safe. <laughs> you know, and we do have to, and it's not only the guardrail, it's making sure that that we don't have to close the bridge because it's not possible for you to drive across it and you know and uh it not to fail yeah and okay. so no it, there's no there's no you know um <laughs> ulterior motive to get rid of all the old and do with any we do everything new just like the interstate but we do have to comply with with regulations and they're not just federal highway the safety, the guardrail. They are the federal highway, the safety, the capacity of the bridge to make sure the next time you drive across that bridge, you'll get across. You know, even if you're coasting, the next time you ride your bike across, you'll get across. Understood. Does that answer your question? I, well, I understood. 
I think the thing that I, I don't understand from this is I don't really see the visuals here. I don't have any sense of what it's going to look like at, um, at all from this from this presentation. And so it I'm looks just very can you can you not I mean, do you not have those types of when you're talking about these different pieces? I you know, I did see the the one, the concrete, the precast. Like when it comes to the railings, do you have can you share your screen in terms of the railings? Like what is being proposed? I really don't have a visual in my head from what the description was. And really all we got out of this was a description. Um, Brian, do you have an elevation of the bridge or just a cross section? It'll look very similar to the way it does with the guardrail that's off the bridge. On the bridge, you have a concrete retaining wall, I believe a concrete parapet. And it will be a, a bridge rail, which is similar. It has three rails and, and posts. And so you'll have more visual as you're going across the bridge because you won't have that, that concrete wall that's there that you are. So you'll have more visual things. They'll look very similar off the bridge if you're driving. If you're driving, you should be able to just, you'll be able to see over the guardrail, but probably not over the bridge rail. Kathy, we have another question here. Okay, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jake, speak his way up here. Thank you. And I had numerous questions, but first and foremost, my name is Jake McWigan, uh, located at 397 Drift Road. Um, you continue to talk about structural deficiencies um, with the bridge. And again, I don't think you clearly answered the question before as to you know why we're addressing this. There are numerous crossings on Drift Road if you drive southbound that don't have guardrails that I would, in my opinion, consider more dangerous. But one simple solution to this, um, as you laid out the detour during the construction process, is I have a way for you to save $2.298 million by putting up four signs that say truck route to use 88. And you wouldn't have to worry about your structural deficiencies. The town can spend $2,000 on, I'm, I'm guessing it's $500 a sign with labor, put $2,000 to solve this problem and make this problem go away. Um, how would you address that or look at it? And the concern is, you know, even earlier on, you said, well, we don't have time to sit with you and pay for more time with PAR engineering. In essence, it's all of our money. It's taxpayer money, whether we're dealing with it from the town or from the state level. So how would we, you know, look at it from that, that area? Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite guess, quite catch your name, but no, we don't. We don't put up signs hoping that that they work. That's not a a valid response to a valid rep or repair or you know option. Why? But I see truck route signs in numerous places in different towns, but depending on the bridge, the width of the bridge, the weight capacity of the bridge. Actually, there's one right in Westport on Forge Road uh, where it crosses over a very similar situation. And I would say that that probably culprit's worse than the one on Drift Road. Correct. But that's an existing condition. And that's to try to keep trucks off of a bridge that's already deficient. We wouldn't hope to use it on after we repair the bridge that the point of repairing the bridge is to prevent uh, installing those signs that aren't followed and aren't enforced uh, do i have a follow-up question have you visited the actual location of this bridge in, in drift road specifically i have not well how can you make decisions about it i am i am not making any decisions about it PAR has been there. They've been there and they inspected your bridge in 2021. And they are advising us as far as what their recommendation is based on our requirements. And I, I think that's a concern because we're dealing with an extreme road that's a, a rural road has a 30 mile per hour speed limit. And, you know, there was discussions about, well, we, we don't have bike or pedestrian crossings over that bridge. It'll be wide enough where they can. Um, if you came to Drift Road and hung out on a Saturday or Sunday morning in the summertime, you'd see the amount of traffic from both pedestrians, runners, and bikers 
uh, through the roof. And I, I think that's a concern. I mean, the state or well, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has spent num numerous millions of dollars to implement bike paths. Sometimes bike paths that go to nowhere, like the one on 88. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just ends. Yeah, that's and, um, you know, you see, you see them all over the place. There's one on Flint's Corner in Dartmouth. So to, to basically dispel our concerns with both the guardrail and the rural character and nature of the road, I think is, is really just doing a disservice to us as residents. And then at the same time, essentially saying that the town needs to come up with $1.5 million <laughs> to pay for this, which uh, I'm sitting next to the chairman of the select board and we are trying to find money for numerous, numerous projects here in this town. And I don't think this would be something that should be at the top of that priority list. So that's no. all I have to say. That's really not a question. It's just more of a concern that I don't think this project is a cookie cutter project like can be stamped, dropped in and be done. And you can just sign off on it, be done with it. And uh, everyone, including the construction company, can make the millions of dollars and leave us with essentially an eyesore. So thank you. Okay. No, um, I, can, I can definitely respond to that, please, if you'd give me a few minutes. Um, first of all, we do, even though the, the bike paths and the multi-use paths seem to be willy-nilly and that kind of stuff, they absolutely are not. Um, those are done with studies and plans for for in the future so that when we do and with federal dollars when we do repave a road or widen a road we make provisions for that path that they intend to go from whatever the rail to trail people decide that it's going to do across the state the municipal small bridge project does not account or does not have provisions for that type of study. It is not currently in the program, like you said, Route 88 is in the program to provide for pedestrians and for bikes and for other things other than vehicular traffic, not drift road. Okay, the Westport, the town applied for these funds from the state and they were approved for this. If the town decides that they, they don't want to complete the design, if they decide they're never gonna do the construction, then they're gonna have to let us know because then this bridge, then this project will stop. But when you applied, when the town of Westport applied for these funds and were approved for it, they gave the need for it and the need is definitely there. You have deficiencies that need to be addressed and it does comply within 10, the spans within 10 and 20 feet. But if you tell me that a person, a representative from the Board of Selectmen has no, no plan to ever construct this, then more than likely we will stop right here as far as the design goes because the, the town indicated when they applied for the funds to design this project, and you're going to have to apply for funds to get it constructed, to get state help to construct it, then someone needs to let me know immediately because that means we stop here. Mm -hmm. Because in order to get these funds, you had to indicate that you, you needed the support, to, that it needed to be done, you wanted it to be done, and you intend to do it into construction. Now, if that's not true, somebody's got to let me know. And I, 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 I might have spoken out of turn. I was only referring to the fact that the town has a financial, many financial hardships on their, on their plate right now. And I don't think when they originally looked at this that they agreed that it was going to be a $1.6 million that the town would have to come up with. That is, that's probably by far and away. They were probably looking at the concern with the bridge, but I do not think that the price tag, mm -hmm. nor honestly having full uh, you know, you were basically releasing full control of that to the state. So, you know, I don't think that either of that was of, of a concern at the time of applying for the grant to at least study the bridge. I don't think that, uh, you know, we're also at a different time with a budget budget scenario than we are currently in 2024. So yeah. I am not speaking for anyone on the select board. I'm only just saying I know as a taxpayer in seeing uh, continued overrides and continued projects that we have coming on line here in town that, you uh, I'm not entirely sure the taxpayers will be very excited about doing spending more money on a bridge that may not need to be replaced. Um, Thank you. Can, can I, Kathy, uh, can, I, can I say two, three things, actually? I wanted to respond to um, 
Who is yeah, this? Or, I'm sorry. David Lalima. David Lalima. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond first uh, three things um, to Jeff Borges' concern because they have an APR and I think his concern is that the farm wouldn't be affected by anything that and I think the answer is that they won't be affected by the construction. I just wanted to be clear about that, that it wasn't going to affect the, their yeah. status as a APR. So yeah. I think that's correct. Is it not? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, the second is, uh, Kathy, that um, I think by the nature of the name of the project, Small Bridge Project, I personally get the sense, the lawyer that, that me, I get the sense that we're talking about intimate, small, unique situations, okay? And what this project is a little illustrating is that no matter how, what you think or say, the minute you cross the line to say we're going to do this project, you are in this panoply of requirements and regulations that are extreme to a certain point, okay? And if you're gonna to continue to do this, my suggestion would be that, that, the, that the engineering people, all of you come up with some creative alternatives that are pre-constructed that don't look like they're pre-constructed. I don't know how you do that, but I think if you're gonna to continue to have these kinds of, because there are more culvert problems and more bridge problems, and people are not gonna to wanna to do this if you're gonna, not you, but if the, if the, if the state the status of, of, of science is that you have to have all of this, we're not gonna want this, okay? Unless you can come up with alternatives that make it palatable for us to wanna have a bridge that doesn't look like the mass turnpike. So I would say the burden may be on, on, the, on the industry to come up with creative alternatives that meet your, satisfy your demands. But here we are, we spent a, an hour or two talking about aesthetics. We're talking about aesthetics. And basically you're saying there's not many options to your aesthetic concerns. That's what you, uh, that's my takeaway from that. And I think, and the last thing is to Jake's point and to, to maybe Jim's point. And I think I can remember having a conversation with Jim where we might've said, be careful what you wish for. Okay. now. I told you on the phone that one of the reasons we were pushing this is we wanted to get rid of these effing guardrails, okay? And you said, this project isn't about guardrails. Well, needless to say, it is about guardrails for us in this community, okay? So maybe there needs to be a better, larger front door that says, if you want our money and you're a rural neighborhood, be prepared because we're gonna give you something you're not gonna like. And, and, and we may have wasted your time we wasted our time. We may wasted your time. I don't know that. That's that's the selectman and the town administrators. But as a resident, it's um sort of appalling. It's, I'm not not take, don't take it personally that we are sitting here. We're talking about this rural, beautiful neighborhood to fix a culvert that needs to be fixed, and this is what you're going to get, whether you like it or not. And that's what it feels like. That. Well, first of all, you people have you have to give us a better idea of what exactly you want different. Okay, I mean, well, do you want it to tried. look like yeah, no, it, tried, like, let me let tried. me talk. I okay. I allowed you to speak. Okay. Let me speak. What exactly yeah. do you want? Come up with okay, it. I'll, give, I'll, I'll read it to you. I, I have it prepared. I'll read it to you. Do you want me to tell you what we want? I, I have it here prepared. Well, I yeah, I could if I can see a picture of what you want. Or if you give it to Jim and Jim will give it to uh, Carr and we can take a look at it. But you have to be specific as far as we want it historic and we want it rustic. Well, you have to be more specific about what actually that means to you. Well, you have to you have guardrails. You that just, we just said to us before, we are not getting more. You said to me specifically, this is it. This is what you said. This is it. No more conversation. No more. I asked at the beginning. Let's have a dialogue. No, Let's no we are not Let's going to. No, we are not going to have another meeting like this. And we're not going to sit down with a special group of people. And we wouldn't even do this. I mean, we might if it were a huge project. But I did tell you that you can submit. Jim graciously said that he would open it up because that's his job. If you give him the information, he will get it to us and we will address it. As, as far as what we can do and why we can't do it. Somebody just already asked, if you come up with an idea that work that Parr says works, will we use it? We absolutely will. Okay. Okay. But I, it's, and I'm sorry that you think that it's, a, it's all about the guardrail to you. Unfortunately, 
we don't have a lot of options for guardrails. We just don't we'll work on that then. <laughs> and maybe I, I don't I don't work for a federal highway. I don't <laughs> crash test vehicles into guardrails. I don't come up with them and I don't do that. And the state isn't responsible for that either. Federal highway is. But you bring up a point. If this was done accidentally and you want it to stop now, it certainly can. If you have no intention of, of, of finding the money to repair it so it doesn't get closed or it doesn't wash out, that's fine. But that can absolutely happen. We are not going to force anything on you. We are not going to spend any dollars that you don't want to do. There's no reason for us. Like I said, the reason that this bridge is being done now is because the town requested it. We well, don't have to do any of this stuff. That's not to say there won't be repercussions of it, but none of this stuff has to happen. But if you give us information about specifically what you want, I think that we've we've already said we can't use timber guardrails anymore. The limits of it, as shown on the plans, are what is the minimum that's required for your classification of roadway. And even if the town was going to spend the $1.7 million to do it all their way, they would still have to put in that guardrail. Okay, thank you, Kathy. That was uh, helpful. Um, this is Patrick McBride. I'm gonna, for the record, I'm gonna state uh, some of the neighborhood design components that we'd like incorporated in the next stage of planning for this project. As I said earlier, we have an opportunity because we have a unique treasure sitting in our front yard. That's the Kirby Bridge. We're gonna be building something 30 feet adjacent to it, that's gonna cost $2 million. That bridge will probably be there for another 100 years. So again, we have the opportunity to do the right thing and do it now, okay? Mm -hmm. The town of Westport signed the uh, community compact in 2017 that said that they will work with the town or with the state in being creative and innovative in solving municipal problems and situations in bringing technology and advancement in the things that we do together. We had to sign that and state that when we submitted our application on the grant. That's all we're trying to do right now is be creative, innovative, and be a partner with you and PAR to do the right thing. Again, we have a unique treasure here. I challenge you to find another bridge program or project in the state of Massachusetts where it parallels and views a 200 year old stone bridge. If that exists, I would like to see that. We would all would like to see that and see what you've done for that. Here's what we'd like. An opportunity to partner with the town, PAR and MassDOT in designing a replacement bridge that enhances the unique historic treasure we have on Drift Road over Kirby Brook. We do not want your typical standard bridge that is found on 195 through 24 in Mass Pike. We want to adopt a creative and innovative approach to constructing a bridge that fits the community and the community's needs. We want a design that is aesthetically complementary to the abutters, neighbors, rural drift road, and the 200-year-old historic stone bridge that is adjacent to the road. We want a bridge and roadway that is safe for all autos, bicycles, and pedestrian traffic. We want to use materials that blend and complement the existing wooded landscape, granite stone walls, granite stone bridge, and the mill building foundation that's found on the site. Specifically, we want wood steel back guardrails, wood blocks, and wood posts. We want a viewing railing overlooking the stone bridge. We want granite capping and stone inlay on the bridge walls or abutments. We want granite curbing on the bridge to manage storm water runoff. We want proper roadway and bridge drainage. Want to reduce uh, and use. Uh, Want to reduce and use realistic utilization of the length of the guardrails versus the standard highway utilization. This is a unique property. And this is a unique site, and it. We do understand that if you have a unique setting, which we do have here, there are exceptions by the chief engineer for Mass DOT. We feel that we fall under that unique setting and that historic setting. I understand there's no legal 
designation to the bridge and the road being historic, but only that that's only a simple application that residents make to the state to get that classification. I've done that before. Sorry, we didn't do that, but it doesn't make it, it doesn't change what we have here. It is historic, it is unique. Uh, we wanna have a minimum impact on the environment, wildlife and the surrounding farms and landscapes and the brook water flow. Some additional community concerns are as follows. The uh, speed limit on drift road is 30 miles per hour, not 40. It is not a highway and does not require the highway guardrail systems that you are talking about. It is a rural road. It does not require that, according to what I read on MassDOT and our research shows us. Uh, steel guardrails, steel posts, rubber blocks, and the length of guardrails are not what we want. They are not necessary. Precast country concrete uh, abutments or culverts may work, but we would like to have some stamped stone or some stone or granite inlay in those uh, 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 structures. A couple other questions, uh, a couple other concerns. Uh, there was a concern about how wide is the road. We found out it's 28, gonna be 28 feet. That's six feet uh, wider than it exists now. Where will you take or where will you get that additional space? Is it gonna be three feet on the east and three feet on the west? Or is it six feet on the west or six feet on the east? We'd like to know that. You heard it from everybody here. We wanna have schematics. We wanna see visual diagrams of what it's gonna look like, not concrete being put in the ground with excavators. We wanna see end result pictures up front before we go any further. Um, a uh, couple other things, uh, basic questions uh, or basic concerns. These new guardrail length will block access to several properties. One being my property, I will no longer have access to a driveway to a buildable lot because of the extended guardrail length. I will no longer have access to my uh, access point to the uh, stone bridge, which is part of my property and part of the Arutas property. You will block that completely from me. You will block others. Uh, access to their drift road completely with these guardrails. That is unacceptable. We have to find a different approach to that. Um, bunch of questions. Has Com Con Con Westport ConCom reviewed this? Doesn't seem like we've gone there. Greg, have we done a uh, traffic study? Hey, as far as what type of traffic study you're looking for? On um, drift road. Crap. On drift road. Yeah. We've used um, traffic count data given to us, but okay. we have not gone out and done a a true study as far as um, looking at intersection counts and things like that. Right. I, uh, under Section 200 in your proposal, you have no work uh, is slated for a traffic study, okay, right. based upon your proposal. So you counted cars. That's great. But don't... Stand us and sit don't sit there and tell us that we need these types of guardrails because we have this kind of type of traffic because you not you have not done that study you have not done that study should you that is not relevant as to what kind of traffic you have you have not done that study have you done a species have you done an essential essential fish habitat assessment or wildlife or rare species assessment that occurs later on in the project as we go to the permitting phase okay so you have not that's not right. accounted for in your uh, in your proposal. You said you, that is not necessary. You said the same thing about the traffic study. You said that is not necessary, or you did, you said mm -hmm. there's no effort anticipated for this task. So right. you tell us one thing, but on your proposal, you say it's not necessary. No, so we're not, using, no, no, I'm sorry, sir, but no, we're using data that was provided to us, historical data provided to us from the mass DOT that's no. done when they inspect the bridges, when we assess the bridges. Oh, um, so that is not a number that we we made up. We we have that number. Well, I'm not talking about numbers. I'm just saying that you didn't even do the assessment. You didn't do you didn't assess it for um, rare species. You didn't assess it for assess it for fish habitat. You didn't assess the road for the traffic. You didn't even do that work yet. But yet you're sitting there telling us we need to have this and we can't have that. Uh, well, no, there's traffic. certain, but there are certain requirements. Regardless, um, it, it's. Um, I don't know what kind of house you have, but um, if you have a two-story house um, and you have stairs going to your second floor, um, the building code, state building code requires you to have a, a handrail. Um, you can tell the bill inspector, but I don't plan on falling off the stairs. You're still going to be required to have that handrail. It's required by law. Um, they will not allow you to occupy the house until you have that in there. Um, there are similar requirements that go to that to roadways. 
um, that have that. So there are certain features that are required based on certain characteristics, just like a handrail is required anytime you are above 30 inches above the ground. They're in there to protect people. Um, just because something hasn't happened doesn't mean it won't. Um, the time to the time to put in a guardrail after something happens is too late. Um, and that's why those design requirements are in there. They're in there um, to prevent the occurrence, not not as a as a reaction to a situation that happened. If it did, then we haven't really done our job yet because we're reacting instead of being proactive. I I, I understand that. I just think there's some uh, mm -hmm. options and alternatives that we need to explore. That's all we're asking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Patrick, if you want to hand that list to Jim. And we will respond to it. I think that we yeah, that some of the points have been brought up and we've already said that, but we will so that we can respond to each one of those, um, you know, in an official manner, because you bring up a lot of things that other people have um, brought up. And even though that this is being recorded and so theoretically there is an official record of it if you want to give that list so that we'd be sure we have it that's quite extensive yeah. and so we'd be sure we have it so that we can address all of those things well yeah i appreciate that i, I will do that I, I have a list prepared for them but a couple other things i want to go on public record saying that on your diagram that par presented they showed uh, wood guardrails in place right now if you look closely at your plan uh it's showing wood guardrails there are no wood guards, guardrails there. Um, okay. So look at that. The land. Existing existing guardrails you had listed as wood. Um, I think you made that correction. We okay. Well, mm -hmm. we were not told of that. We also noted that you said there was no no pipe drainage pipe uh, apparent on the uh, southeast and southwest side. Uh, there are uh, drainage pipes leading to the uh, brook uh, that are not mm -hmm. on your plan. Uh, you do note it in your, uh, some of your writing, but um, there are two drainage pipes leading into that brook uh, that are not on your plan that do need to be uh, included. Uh, on my property, the ancient way in the break uh, in the stone wall is not noted uh, from your engineers. So there's a lot of things that you uh, presented that um, are incorrect. I just want to go on uh, public record stating that. That's all I have. Okay. Like I said, get that list to Jim and we'll respond to those. Does anybody have anything new to um, anything that we haven't brought up before that's not environmental, aesthetic, or I think that's essentially what we've been um, mm. talking before. Kathy, I just got one comment and question. Um, this is Jim Hotnett. So I guess in fairness to Mass Highway, right, the town requested that this design be done. All right, there was grant money available. It was an opportunity for us. We've been made aware that the bridge structure or the culvert is deficient. Mm -hmm. So we know there's an issue there. And whether it happens this year, five years from now, or 20 years from now, at some point, Mass Highway, because they do the bridge inspections, is going to come down and say, we can't use this bridge anymore. And if we get in that situation, then it's not going to be an eight- month period when that bridge can't be used it's going to be a period when the gets designed goes through the whole process you're probably looking at a two three maybe even four year process so that's you know i, I have to say that that's why it's at this point now um mm -hmm. we've mentioned examples of other bridges if you can get me where those bridge locations are i'll be happy to forward them to mass highway and we can see if they've done this work under this project you know that gives us some ability to push forward on our end. And that's why we're here. Right? If we can do it, I'm, we're certainly willing to do that. Um, we mentioned a bike lane and a sidewalk. If a bike lane or a side, if we push for a bike lane or a sidewalk and we could push for it, it's gonna make that bridge but another eight, 10, maybe 12 feet wider. Um, and I just wanna make sure before we start pushing for that, that's what the community wants. Okay, we're, so we're, bike not lane board, we're, we're not pushing for that. Okay. All right, so if you can get me examples, if you have any additional questions, if you have any additional comments, if you can get them to me in the next week, by next Friday, I will make sure I get them up to Palm and up to the uh, Mass Highway. Okay. Other than that, thanks. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, thank you. Uh, one thing, excuse me, Jim, the municipal small bridge requires that you stay within the municipal right of way, within your property, so you don't have the additional expense of re acquiring property to construct this project. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that if you want a sidewalk and you go outside the right of way, that it's going to be dropped out of this program. You're just, like I said, it's not a part of this. It's specific to be in this project, in this program. You're supposed to stay in your existing right of way. It's just going to put another glitch in the system. Yeah. But if it's something that you more than likely because it's not warranted, um, there would have to be in order to do it, you may, the town may have to pay for it themselves or, you know, pay for a study to get it warranted. Okay, if you want you. to get the sidewalk, we have given you, like I said, we've given you shoulder and PAR has given you the most area that they can and re to make a continuous curve and still stay within the right of way. So we don't, and I know it looks like the bridge because all you can see is the edge of the the paved surface when you see the plan view of it you have to appreciate the fact that we have slopes and stuff like that and during construction we don't want to to mess up anybody's private property so even though it looks like we have more room there for additional width we don't if we want to stay on in the towns right away okay uh, one last comment on that too and to jim and everyone i would say that i think you should double check your right away uh because i think that could be challenged as well um, i think your overlay is too large and the aruda farm and my property uh was released uh years ago so just check your right aways because i think you might already be encroaching and thinking your right away is your right away and i don't think that is the case so i'm just for the public record I think that that right away was done by us in 2020, but I will double check that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Anybody you. else have anything else? No. no. If not, thank you all very much for your time. Um, like I said, if you have any additional questions or concerns or you want something specifically answered in writing, and I mean, we'll probably just send you an email if you would give us your email address too. If you want any of these responses in writing, please make sure that Jim has a copy of those. But thank you all for coming and um, have a good evening. <laughs>